Thank you, Michelle. All right, and next up I think is Mike. Michael Mendez. Mike Mendez. I was hoping you could speak. Come on down. Nope. Got to cut off the conversation. Give it your time. Yes, a working meeting. So, <clears throat> so now that we had a great discussion with Michelle, <laughs> I have to, those are some really big shoes to fill. <laughs> okay, so welcome to the uh, ITP2 ETL working group. So I just want to go over a little bit about some of the past stuff that we've done, uh, kind of how we're, when we first started the ETL group, we actually kind of literally thought of it as taking data from your EHR and putting it into ITB2. And that's how we were thinking about ETL. We've now started in the last year to think that, well, how about we just ETL data out from ITB2? And so that's kind of where we're kind of looking at now. We spent a lot of time on getting data in, and now we're thinking about how do we get data out. Um, so we do have a GitHub repository where we put all our, our work. Um, one of the first things that we did was we kind of created a checklist, an idea of like, what do you need to do when you load in data? Uh, it might just seem simple, you just take the data, shove it in. Uh, but there's things to consider like dates and numeric values uh, and how the units are. I mean, so when a baby is born, they're actually measured in uh, ounces and not pounds. And so after they hit a certain age, they actually start doing pounds and ounces. So, and then the calculate. So if you're not doing the units correctly, you'll have some really big babies. Uh, so th that was some of the stuff that we put into the documentation. Uh, we wrote a, uh, so we wrote some validation scripts that we took from Achilles. And that was one way that you can kind of validate your data. Uh, it verified that, like, say, someone uh, didn't have observations after their death date, uh, that their age was within certain limits. There wasn't uh, data in there before someone was born, uh, and just some uh, checks and balances of the data. Um, as, as I said, it's like the, no one over 150 years old and finding observations without patients, stuff like that. So it did kind of a validation, and we took a lot of things from Achilles. Uh, so then after that, we started looking at uh, updating the ontology <laughs> that Michelle had done. This was done in 2019, 20, 2020. And we basically, because we really just had the Harvard demo uh, ontology. So we incorporated the ACT ontology into IGP2. And then with Jeff Klan's work, we, did, we added the total nums into it. So those were kind of two things. And then we started looking at, okay, how do we actually get data from your EHR into ITB2 easily? And so what we decided was, okay, you have various different EHR. You have Epic, NextGen, all scripts, various different ones. How are we going to get those into ITB2? And we were like, okay, how will we have a stepping stone? You go from your EHR to OMOTH. And then once it's in OMOTH, we already have scripts that will take OMOTH into ITB2. So you just have to get that little step into OMOTH and then, and then run the scripts. Uh, the reason we thought like that was, well, because people use all of us and other things, it will actually be killing two birds with one stone. You're going to get your OMOTH data, but then you're going to be able to run our scripts so will automatically convert it into ITB2. So you don't have to think about, how do I get it from this OMOTH to ITB2? We took care of that. Um, so, so that was part of this, and it, that was the SQL Server e, EDW scripts. Uh, also at that time, as we know, COVID came along. So we, uh, we added the ACT ontology for COVID, and then we started looking at like making uh, synthetic data because we had just had 133 patients set. So we created a, basically a 1.2 million synthetic patient set, and then we added like 2,000 COVID patients to that. Uh, and then, so that was kind of some of the stuff that we did uh, last year. So now we're coming to now. <laughs> and so, so, so now this is kind of merging into what we had talked about last hour. And so we looked at like 
obviously some cancer data. I was working with Mary. And so this, might, this one might actually kind of cooperate into maybe we'll find some ontology that we like. We'll put it onto Michelle's uh, ontology uh, <laughs> a cloud service. And so that will then do the check off that way. Yes, we have cancer. And then we just have to make some synthetic cancer data for that. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is a genomic data. And so we're trying to figure out, OK, first of all, how are we going to load genomic data into ITPT? Because we're talking like massive amounts of data. And I could tell you that if you just try to load the whole genome into ITB2, you'll probably get 10,000 patients before SQL Server will crash. <laughs> so, and as a lot of us have, we have millions of patients. So even if you can get 10,000, that's nothing. So we have to figure out how are we actually going to do this. And it's not going to be a relational database. It's going to be something else. And it's going to be custom coding on the ITBT side. That is not going to have to point to Postgres, SQL Server, or it's going to have to post, point to something else. And so, which is fine. I mean, that's what we're here for. We'll make the changes to the code. Uh, but we just need to make it so that it works, it's reliable, and it doesn't crash databases. Uh, so that's the genomic side that we want to talk about. Uh, there's also ongoing fire. Loading, Loading data into I2B2 and exporting uh, I2, uh, data from I2B2. So that's kind of, that was kind of thing, some of the things we had talked about. Uh, some of the stuff is still ongoing. I know Kavi has done some work on the fire side. And uh, the continued just clean up of any of the COVID-19 synthetic data. So that's kind of what we talked about last year that we've kind of still kind of worked on. Uh, but, so now I'm going to go into something completely new. So bulk exporter. So we, it was kind of talked about in uh, one of the NIH projects. I'm not sure if I could say the name, but I think you've all heard the name. Uh, so that one. Um, and so they were looking at a way to like export data from I2B2. I know we have the XLS plugin. There's various other exporters, but nothing really like was able to export massive amounts of data because all the XLS exporter will not export 100 gigs of data, okay? It's just not gonna work. So we were like, okay, can we do something on the server side that will allow us to do this? And that's kind of where the bulk exporter kind of originated. So the idea is it's gonna use uh, ITB2 to basically export the data. Uh, it needs to work on all three platforms, SQL Server and Oracle and Postgres. And so I was able to write something that would basically like export 35 uh, million observation facts in about 10 minutes. And it created a four gig file. So as far as performance wise, it wasn't too bad. This was done on the data enclave. Uh, this was kind of just set up. Uh, it probably will be quicker. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do was make it so that uh, you could kind of pick your own file name, how you want to do it. There's also been talk about like, okay, so once you create this file, where does it go? <laughs> because yeah, you create a file. So one, one thing we thought about was, well, what if we just have it save it to a file share? And then maybe change, uh, maybe that uh, file share either ITB2 could change the permission and say that they, we know what the user name is and it's an Active Directory user. Maybe uh, the ITB2 has an ele elevated per permissions that it could actually just change that folder and give that user access to it. So that when, so for example, say Michelle and I on two different projects, both in ITB2, uh, she exports something, it gets put into Michelle's folder, but then because I'm not in her project, I can't see it. And so, and likewise. Uh, or it could be that we're in the same project and it, I treat you as really knows all the users in a project, it would just assign all those users to that folder. So that when Michelle exports it, everyone in her group can see that folder. And so they just go to a file share, they see the folder, they see, the folder, they see all the files that were exported. 
like I said, this is an open discussion. Uh, is thoughts about that before I go into more in depth of the design of how it how it actually works. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how you would integrate the permissions into yeah. that from IT to. Yeah, so one of the things, the file system that I was thinking about is what was used by the RPDR for years. And so the uh, so RPDR, as some of you might know, is like kind of like the grandfather, parent of IT to. It was what Sean Murphy had done years ago, on, like in the 90s, late 90s. And then ITP2 kind of was like a, a revision after that. Uh, RPDI does things that ITP2 can't do, like this exporter. Uh, we call it PIF. I don't know. Uh, I forget what it stands for. <laughs> but uh, so that's kind of, so there were some things I was taking from that RPDI PIF that I kind of started to incorporate into this. And that was one of them. Because was, that was one of the things, like, OK, once we export a file, how do we actually get it to the user? Because before, it was always the client side would then do it. Uh, Can you make it configurable, though? Possible, yes. I mean, anything's possible, Michelle. It's programming. <laughs> it's software. It's software that has started to be developed but hasn't been finished. So it could be, what do you mean by configurable? That's actually a great idea. I mean, I, I, so you could say, okay, I want it to go to one share or I want to go to Dropbox. Yeah, that's what you mean. And so, yeah, so it could be the same type of thing. It, instead of it going to a Windows share, it's going to go to a one share or it's going to go to Dropbox. Yeah, I think that's, and I like that, yeah. But I think if you make it configurable, it'll probably work. Yeah. <laughs> Question. Yep. Yeah, for the export, uh, our yep. SaaS users and our R users, uh, it's because if you export directly out of the observation fact, it's like a vertical data, many, many rows, right? Yep. Yeah, long and skinny. So we were looking at doing it as a CSV file, which we can work with, um, but have it pivot back into horizontal this way. Y yes, I, yeah. I can do that. I, I'll explain yep. that, how, okay. it, how that's done in a, in okay. a minute. All right. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, so I think I kind of went over this already. It's kind of like, a, so it's going to use some of the existing uh, pig, uh, code using like the breakdown code. So they, they're going to actually be breakdowns. And I can, I'll explain a little bit of how that works and why, uh, why I chose to do that. Uh, so one thing I do want to point out is everything is done in the database. So all of your ex how you want to structure your file, whether it is a long skitty or long, is done in the database. So you're basically creating select statements or stored procedures that get run. So you can easily say select star from observation fact, and it will just be like that. Or you could say like how you could say uh, connect your uh, patient dimension observation facts. So you have like patient. Uh, age, gender, race, and then some facts associated to it. So, or if you have another database, you can actually connect to that if it has permission. So, so this is uh, current, kind of like, because we connected up to the breakdown, how does that actually get seen by the end user? And so in the initial testing I was doing, I was just literally connecting it up to the, like the run query that you could actually just select some, like select which one. Uh, oh, it's not listed in there. Uh, but it would be listed in the, uh, the run breakdown of like export demographics. And you could click on it, it would export it. Uh, but then obviously, I didn't really want to put it in here. I want to have like a separate plugin that does all of that because it's, 
you're gonna you want to make your query run it and then fine tune it and then export the data. Uh, but then, so I did notice in the visual attributes of uh, 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 this one, I forget what this is called, uh, of the run query one, it's normally set for LA, which is, means the leaf active. If you set it to LE or anything besides A, like, and I called LE as leaf exporter, uh, it actually does not show up in the uh, run query anymore. But what it does do is it still shows up in the XML that gets sent back to the user. And that's what I'm kind of pointing out in the bottom part is uh, the patient dem uh, demographics PSV is there, but the visual attribute is LE. And so as you see in the top one, it's not in there, but it's still in that XML request. So we could create a custom plugin that then also calls that same API request but then says, okay, anything that's an LE, display those in the plugin, okay? So we'll have like an export plugin or something, okay? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's the query type. So they're both kind of there. You have the query type, and then you'll have this uh, bulk exporter also kind of in there, but they can be hidden. Okay, it's more of a programming type of thing, yep. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is kind of, this is very rough right now. I'll, I'll admit this part is very rough. It still needs to kind of be ironed out. Uh, there's lots. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yes, it gets stored in the QT tables, yes. But it could be like huge, right? The whole CSV file? No, 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 you're not saving the CSV. You're, you're saving like what you want to export, the, t the type, like the demographics. Right, so in the RPDR, you can export like demographics, you can export labs, medications, procedures. So this is that kind of idea, is you'd be able to pick, I want demographics, labs, and procedures, form I query and give me all of the data for that. Okay. It will then export it into each individual CSV files into like a OneDrive or Dropbox. Does this need to happen in the run query? I mean, can you no. get the patient type and then the plugin point to the old and then pull from the demographics? Yes, that, that, that's, the initial, that's the final plan. That, that's why I'm doing this LE type of thing. So it will still be, it, it will be considered a breakdown, but you won't see it in here. There'll be a separate pl plugin that will understand these visual attributes of LE. I'm probably not explaining this properly. I, I realize I I, I understand. I, I see what I'm trying to do. I'm just not explaining it properly. <laughs> Okay, so each, uh, so each one of these, like the gender breakdown, the gender patient breakdown, it's actually an individual class that does something special. Uh, the same with like the age patient breakdown. There's a class file to deal with that. I'm creating a separate bulk downloader uh, class file that does something different, okay? 
Yes, it's. Yeah, yeah, I explain a little bit more. Maybe, they, okay. So one thing I then started to do was, so we have in the, the newer versions, we created a hive cell pram, which basically took all the original parameter files that we had and threw it into the database. What? Yeah, <laughs> I know, it's, it was, we should have done that years ago. The reason we couldn't do it years ago was because of the way JDBC could uh, point to uh, the schemas. It didn't know how at the time. Uh, but anyway, that's technical. Uh, so we created a whole bunch of new uh, cell params for this. And one of them, like Michelle said, is going to be like your destination. It's going to be uh, something called EDU Harvard CSV Export CSV Destination. And in that destination, it will be like Dropbox or OneDrive and then whatever parameters are needed for that. Uh, but to kind of quickly go over some of the parameters that you can change is because we're dealing with CSV files, we basically took and utilized all the standard things you can do with CSV, uh, like escaping the, like how do you want to do the escapes? How do you want to do like the tabs? Do you want to do tab, pipe, semicolon? Uh, what's your delimiter? So these are all the parameters that you can specify, how you want to do it. Uh, you can also specify how many records in the result set do you want. This is more for performance-wise. So if you're exporting half a terabyte of data and you have like 500 gigs of RAM on your server, you can increase that 50,000 to maybe like half a million or something. And because you just have plenty of space, uh, but so that's a configurable. The other one that probably will be utilized is the export file name. So this would specify what the file name you want to be. And so everything within the squiggly brackets, uh, kind of like a custom parameters. So like the project ID, that's the name of your project. Uh, it typically is like demo in the demo one, or you could have it like your act or whatever, whatever you called your project, that's what would get replaced in that project ID. Uh, username is self-explanatory, that's your user, that would be. Uh, and all of this is, this is just an example. It could have it however you want it. I mean, I just made this as a sample one. Uh, and then you have your result instance ID, that's kind of like the QT result ID. But of course, all of that's configurable. Uh, so the last two were kind of ones I was kind of playing around with because I was kind of pseudo uh, PDR-ish type of thing. One was like a work folder. So the idea was if you selected that you want to export like demographics, uh, medication labs, um, it would all do that in this kind of work folder area that you wouldn't see, but it's got kind of done in the background. But you need to say where your work folder is uh, as an admin because you're going to have to have space if it's, you can't just put it anywhere. Uh, so that's kind of where the work folder. The other thing was the encryption. So in the RPDR, we actually encrypt the, uh, the files so that pe only the people who get the files can actually decrypt it. And so, I was, so I'm able to like basically take all those CSVs in the work folder, zip it up, and then and put an encryption on it. Um, and so this is two different types, AES encryption or standard, and this is for zip. Uh, the negative thing about this is, so on the Macintosh, it supports natively AES encryption. On Windows, Windows 10 and 11, unfortunately it doesn't. You're gonna have to use a third party tool like 7-zip in order to decrypt it. I know Michelle's shaking her, are you a Mac user? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, and I am not really sure what to do about that yet, but uh, like I said, this is st still in the uh, development <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rename it to Gala, or a, a Honeycrisp. <laughs> yeah. So these were some of the parameters. So actually, a lot of this code has been already committed to GitHub. So if you want to take a look at it, feel free. Uh, the other thing, so these are the, the special variables that, I was, that you have, like username project, the other ones that was, was in the example, but you can use, it's like random underscore XXX. XXX is just, uh, 
it, it would be the numbers that you want. So let's say you wanted a five digit random number, you would just say like, you put like four X's there or four numbers. Uh, and then it would just create a random number for that. Um, the date with the XXX uh, is how the date format would be. And on the, on the right side is what you would put for your date format. So if you wanted to put like uh, the full like 09, 20, 22, I think is it 20 is it's the 20th. Yeah, so you would put like whatever the corresponding ones of that one. Uh, you, you've dealt with dates and stuff. So it basically gives you a, a huge flexibility for how you want to format your dates. Um, and then the other thing was the query name, because that was kind of talked about in that other project. Uh, <laughs> that they kind of wanted the query name in it. So I was like, okay, yeah, that's pretty. Uh, it does a little bit of the cleanup of the query name, because sometimes you can have like characters in the query name that you can't have as an actual file name. So it does clean up your file name after this is all done. Yeah. Okay. So this kind of talks about like how how you're doing the files. So this is the next screen is actually starting to get into like the nitty gritties of how this actually works and why how are you able to do this all in the database without having to do any custom coding. So this is an example. Let's say you want to export your demographics. Okay. So in the QT breakdown path table, you would have a name and it can be any name, but I'm, I'm calling it patient demographics, uh, no CSV. Uh, for, th forget about the no CSV for a second, but uh, it's, that's the name of it, okay? And then <laughs> I should not copy and paste. My <laughs> As you can see, there's an exact <laughs> BSF niche and short. <laughs> I, when I was talking with Sean about this, uh, we uh, <laughs> did I edit this on the fly? <laughs> okay, so the idea is in the value for, in the value area. Okay, J just for now, just just think of the select statement. Forget about this part up here. Okay, just think it. So in your value section would be your select statement of what you would want to export. And in this case, you're exporting like patient num. And it's going to export it in the, the header. It's going to say normally patient num. But let's say you don't want patient num. You want it to say patient number. So as you do in SQL, you'd say select a patient num as patient number. And so when you sit in your, in your SQL, when you run that in SSIS or SSMS, you'll see it says patient num as the first header. So basically, you're creating your select statement of exactly how you want your CSV to be done. Okay, the very so that would be all of the stuff in your select statement. You're from because we're getting it from the patient dimension because we want patient demographics. It's your patient dimension table. The other thing is okay if you just have it as that end, you're just going to get everyone in your patient dimension table, and that's not what you want. You want something from your query. And that's why you have that little special DX with the squiggly bracket. So the DX is a, kind of, it's a temp table that's generated by ITB2 when you run your query. And it has all your patient numbers in it. So that is how I'm using that. Yeah, for your cohort. That is how I'm getting the exact number of patients that you actually wanted in your list. And so that is part of the, the where clause where that patient number from the DX table is uh, connected to the patient dimension. Okay, so that so that's kind of how the mag magic is working. That's how. You Right, yeah. So this allows you to do Right, because it's a completely separate class file. 
Right, it's not going back to results. It's basically going, it's, run, it's running this query, throwing it into that CSV uh, uh, converter thing and basically exporting and ex dumping all the data. Okay, so now if we kind of look at the very top where it says like exec BS, BFT1234 or BST, <laughs> that was, we were talking about running stored procedures instead of a select statement. Okay, so that's why, and I, when I was talking with Sean, what? Is that now? It hasn't been fully tested. So some of, the, I mean, I'm able to do the bottom part fine. Uh, we started talking about the top part, and I don't see why we can't because we're already running stored procedures from within I2B2. There's a ton of stored procedures in the CRC that get executed. So this is kind of how, okay, but what do we want to add to it? It's like you run into stored procedures, but you also want to add parameters to it. So how, what type of parameters do we want? Uh, and I was also looking at, okay, so you have, when you built your query up, you have all the ontology there. Can that ontology also be used in this somehow? As a parameter. So, so maybe you don't want all the data for the patient. You just want all the data for that patient with those concepts. So you're doing asthma one, you just want all the asthma data. You don't want all the data for that patient. So, that but that that only shows Yeah, but that only shows you that doesn't get the data. That's not exporting it. That's just showing it to you on a pretty graph. Yeah, but it's not going to get the T val, the N val. So, uh, so this is kind of how the magic of, and and you can extend it thoroughly. The uh, the no CSV. Uh, so that was talked about in that project also that they uh, didn't want to actually export a CSV file. They like the idea of running the stored procedures but they didn't want to export anything. And so what we ended up doing, so originally we were talking, okay, we'll, we'll tack on this thing called no CSV, and then the program would know, okay, I'm not gonna export a CSV. Uh, that got changed. So the other table that we have to change is the QT result type, okay? And in here, it's gonna have, the name is gonna be the exact same name as the QT breakout, okay? Uh, the description is what gets displayed to the end user. So this is what you see in uh, that query run where it had like uh, patient, uh, uh, patient, uh, patient uh, set, patient encounter uh, set, patient count. That's what you see. That's all coming from this QT result type. Okay. Um, the user role data LDS is the minimum role in order to actually run this breakdown slash bulk downloader, okay? Uh, the visual attribute, as we kind of talked about earlier, can be like LA if you actually want to see it in that run one, or it could be LA that gets used in a third, in some plugin that hasn't been developed yet. Um, the class, this is the important part. So the class is the actual class file not working to it, is the actual class file on I2B2 that actually does all the work. And so this is where we decided, okay, uh, we're gonna have a no CSV downloader and a regular just downloader. Uh, if you select, if you like put it in, in the entry in the database and say no CSV downloader, it actually does not execute the downloader part of it. And so you won't get a CSV file. If you just use the standard patient downloader, then you actually will get uh, a CSV file. And it'll, it'll create it based on whatever is in that uh, high print. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I must have missed it, but why would you not want to get the CSV file? Uh, because it was talked about in a project I was on that they wanted just to execute the stored procedure, and so, but they didn't want to create a CSV file. 
the output of the stored procedure could be the same type of idea. It could, call, it could basically export something into a folder. I don't, I, I kind of agree, it's like, yeah, why would you want to, but I, it was an easy implementation. Okay. It could do that, yes, it could store it into a table. Yeah, as, as uh, Griffin said, yeah, actually that would be a good idea because you could actually create a subset, a, a, like a separate project. So actually, let's go down that path a little bit. Would it be useful if we created, like, instead of exporting to a CSV, you export to a whole new ITB2 project? Yep. So it's very helpful if, if you figure out who, who ran it. Let's say Al Patel ran it, and there is Al Patel schema in Postgres. You parse the data under that. Mm -hmm. Let's say query it. That yep. would be helpful. Right. Because one thing you could do is you could change that data LDS to a role of admin, so that only admins are able to create projects. Based on, so, but, so they would have access to your current project or current query run, and you would say, okay, I created this uh, run, and now I want it to be its own separate project. And you would basically drag over that, uh, run, that run, and then you would say, create project, and it would create a whole new ITB2 project based on that. The, yeah, you could probably do that too, yeah. Hi, so um, I think this, this is related to the whole question of, for example, the project request plugin mm -hmm. in, the, in the user interface. Yep. That, you know, it seems like that's, um, that's something that creates a project. It puts the project in, um, again, with, uh, with uh, approvals yep. in the database. Yep. But then there is no mechanism to actually create the I2B2 project itself. There's a request for it in the database, yep. but there's no actual project. Is, is there, can this be leveraged in a way that this could actually create the project from the project request, for example? The yes. same kind of technology yeah. could that be used? Yes. I, I think that's probably, yes, that's probably the right way to do it. Does that mean that that's going to be done for us? <laughs> Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> Along with internationalization. That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and Mike, one other thing, I'm just getting a, another request. If, uh, if folks aren't using the microphone, if you can restate the question. Okay. That's yep. useful for people who are on the Zoom. Okay. But I'll also run around the mic. And okay. Griffin over here. So, yeah, so, so that's kind of the bulk up, update uploader. I, I really like the idea of actually creating projects from that, so that sounds really useful. Um, yeah. Yeah, so let me go over some of this really quickly and then I can, what? Oh, yeah. So, so you're, you're leveraging here the breakdown infrastructure. Correct. Um, so the advantage of that is that you're not having to make a lot of modifications to the user interface, right, to be so you're leveraging a lot of stuff that's already in the breakdown. So it's a little bit of a hack, kind of adding that extra class and squeezing stuff in. Yeah. If it's just a CSV, it might be okay, but if you're launching a whole new project or need parameters or other kind of things on that, the alternative is to create a plugin. So in the UI, like in Shrine, we don't have, but in the new ITB2 UI, um, which we'll do in the user interface working group next, it's really, there's a whole plugin, new plugin architecture for it, where if you had a page where um, it was dedicated to all the parameters you would want to create a new, um, a new project to define the different data elements in there. You have a lot more flexibility than what you can do here with the um, 
breakdown version. Of right. So that's kind of so this is uh, kind of how we're getting around that. So in the visual attribute of that pram of of that value, normally it's LA for leaf active. So I, un I understand how this is kind of you can squeeze that in, and I think this is fine if if the goal is to export a CSV file. Yeah. But if you're doing something like spinning up a coronet instance or new projects or something like that, there's probably additional parameters and complexity around this where maybe instead of doing it this way, you would want a, a, an actual plugin where you can have a, a custom UI for defining all the different parameters you need for um, a much more complicated workflow that occurs after the data is Oh, yeah, no, I see what you mean. Um, yeah. The limitation of this is that the user can't provide additional parameters for what happens to the data after it's assembled. So if it's just exporting a CSV file with some kind of templated name in a folder that's based on your Active Directory name, then that's it's a fixed thing and that's fine here. But if you're if you're trying to do exports where it's a more complicated thing that happens after the data is pulled out of the fact table, um, this is a very limiting UI here, whereas um, launching this from a, a separate plugin allows you to put in lots more parameters and um, have a program that both generates the file as well as doing a bunch of other stuff with it. Right. Okay. So what about, let's take the project uh, request uh, proposal. So there's already existing uh, UI and code that does the project request. It saves it into the project request tables. Then an admin would go to here, and then they would say they would select that. Uh, they would find out which project it was. They would select, uh, drag that project across, and then say, uh, create project from their little list. Then that would then execute some stored procedures that would uh, look at the look at the project request, figure out all the parameters from that, and basically does some magical SQL to create the project. <laughs> yeah. Launching a new project or exporting data to the Fortnite. There's a lot of stuff involved in that. I mean, the, I would think it would be a whole interface for just doing that. We could call this this kind of one of its steps, um, but. I wouldn't think you would go through like a, a, one of the different breakdowns or export things. They don't do mutation list timeline, but like launch a whole project. Um, but I was lot. thinking the, the whole launching of the whole project would all be like some complicated, uh, complicated stored procedure that does all the work. Yeah. Just, just calling it post processing, you know, like just, just calling it post processing is probably enough to capture the idea. There's all these other things that are going to happen. Downstream, yep. that you aren't, you know, don't know a priori, right? Um, you, you could create a, you could encode some parameters of some flags into the file name, I suppose, which would give a clue to as as to how to post process. But there's a, you know, there's a whole all kinds of things gonna, that are going to be downstream that could consume I this. A, I have a data export plugin inside Israel. There's a whole, there's a whole bunch of parameters to it on whether or not you want to de-identified or you want to identify file size. There's a lot of stuff that goes into um, selecting all the options for the data export. And my kind of point is that for, for kind of a can type of thing, this could probably solve a lot of problems in a really nice way. But I think there's, um, there's also value in the this, this separate plugin approach to trigger this as well as um, capture all the other stuff that's going to be needed to do more complicated things and just export the facts as a CSV file. Right, yeah, no, I agree completely, Greg. The other thing that's in the back of my mind is, so I did all that red cap stuff, but I'm not sure how, I haven't seen it being used. So I wanted to see if I could get something out there quickly to see if it's used instead of spending a lot of time making a huge thing and then it's not being used. So maybe it is that we do this, and then it's like, yes, the community does like it. So then we kind of modify it and then 
as Griffin says, maybe create a plugin afterwards. I mean, it's still going to get to the end result of having a CSV or executing a stored procedure. It's just that instead of it being part of the QT breakdown, it's now a plugin. For the end user, it's going to be no different. They're not going to be like, oh, I would. It's just a UI thing for them. <laughs> Actually, can I just jump in here real quick? This was, Mark, this was your suggestion. We're going to leave a microphone over here on the stand. So if folks want to come up, if you're more comfortable doing this, rather than having me charging over at you with the mic, uh, you can do that. So that'll be a signal <laughs> that you have a question. Just come over to the mic. If you do want to ask a question and you're comfortable, I'll just raise your hand. I'll bring over the mic for you. All right, we got two. So mm -hmm. Take it away. Thanks. Hi. So um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what is planned for the upgrade in the user interface. The, uh, there, there, hopefully there will be an upgrade in the admin interface as well. And I could imagine that once, you know, an admin, once someone, uh, I think the, if the project request plugin could be modified to like send an email to the admin when a new project request is, is created, I think there are triggers probably in the database that could be, that could do that also. Yeah. When an admin is notified that there's a request for a new project, then someone can go into the admin interface, for example, and I could imagine that they could see, oh, here's the new project that someone wants. Who is it that, that wanted that? Who are the people on their team? I'm going to cr click a button, create that project based on their query. I'm going to drag and drop these people's names into that project after it's already made. Yeah. Then you have a project. You've given authorization to the people. And I think that in the admin interface, that could be a useful, a useful addition. I, no, I agree completely on that. Uh, the admin, I know, I, I agree. The admin should be modified somehow especially for like NT authentication. If you, if you want to do NT, like create a user, you create the user, then you have to set all the parameters in, like uh, authentication method. I can't even remember the other two. I have to go look it up. Uh, you should not have to do that. You should just basically add the user and it should already know, oh, your domain is this, your primary domain is that. And it should be really a one button click, not this thing and then What's my domain again? Yeah. So I, I agree, the admin and having something like that that's what really easy to create would be very useful. Michael, we're, um, uh, we're talking abstractly about this project request thing. I, for one, have used the project request plugin. Okay. But I'm not sure, you know, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask a few questions to survey the group here on, on the use of the project request plugin. So I'm wondering, <laughs> is there anyone, um, please raise your hand if you're aware of the project request and approvals tables in the database. See, even Griffin doesn't raise his hand. Okay, I won't even ask any further questions about this. <laughs> Thank you. There's only two of us who are aware of the project request and approvals table in the database to support the project request plugin. So we disabled the plugin. So I'm aware of it. We don't know okay. Yeah, it, it was kind of one thing that we thought about, Sean and I, and never really got done. I think this could be the connection. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I know I want to give at least five minutes to Kave to talk about his thing in the end, but I do want to just go over, just quickly, this, this was a great call, uh, talk. Um, very quickly, so I know uh, Michelle who ran away. <laughs> Uh, in the ontology, we talked about genomic data, uh, and I was trying to figure out how to get genomic data into ITB2. So on the data enclave, uh, I started actually just downloading the Thousand Genome Project. Uh, and so I downloaded a whole bunch of files. This is just a screenshot of my older directory. Uh, but yeah, so we want to figure out what do we get, how, like, these are some huge files. What do we want from the files? What do we want to extract from these files? Do we want to just have these files and have some genomic reader pass them out quickly, or how do we want to deal with it? Uh, so that's something to think about. Uh, the other thing was just it was complete because I was dealing with this genomic thing and not really going too far with it because it was complicated and I didn't really get my head around it. I wanted a low-hanging low fruit. So what I did was I actually started downloading uh, from Twitter uh, tweets dealing with COVID. 
and I downloaded 80 million tweets. <laughs> and the 80 million tweets are on the, on the community enclave. And so, I, I mean, it, there was no use case for this. This is purely me just playing around. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of just talk quickly in the next three minutes about kind of like what I did, like how I actually got 80 million tweets onto the enclave. Because you can't just go there and say, download the data. There's no download data. What you actually get is, so someone actually had a list of, uh, they knew what they were, but they, actually, but they can't release that. All they can release is the Twitter IDs. And so then from that, you have to create an API for, with Twitter. They can then download the data. But you have to do it one at a time. And so th there's actually a, so this program right here is actually the one that, uh, uh, that actually downloads it. And it will, it will monitor your rate so that you don't oversee it. And as you can see, that's 81 million tweets that was done. Uh, so then behind it, which you can't see, it, there's a little button that says CSV that will create a CSV file. Otherwise, it's in a JSON file. And because I want to put it into a database, I want a CSV file. Of course, when you have 81 million tweets, uh, the CSV file, that button doesn't work. Uh, so I actually wrote a little uh, Python program, which is running here, that will basically take that JSON and convert it into CSV. And so that's what's running there. Uh, and above it is actually just the list of the files. And as you can see, there's like half a terabyte file right there. Uh, these are all the Twitter IDs. Okay, and so once you actually load it into your database, this is, this, these are all the columns. And there's actually a lot of data about it. It's like you have the coordinates. So this was on your Twitter account. You can actually say, like, tell, uh, record your actual location. And so this is the Latin one of that one that was done on March 19th, uh, the various hashtags. <clears throat> and then eventually uh, in the, I forget, uh, where is it? Uh, your hash, uh, one of these actually has the actual tweet on it. Um, I actually, I didn't show it in here intentionally just because I wasn't, I had to go through and make sure all, all of it was proper because these are actual real tweets and it might have language that's not appropriate. So, <laughs> so I didn't wanna just, I was like, I oh, forget it, I'll just leave it out. And it is there, it's just that I didn't want to <laughs> talk to HR. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, so I, one last thing, so Kava can jump, is this is actually, <laughs> if you want the, the Python script, this is the Python script that actually will take a CSV file, or take the JSON and convert it to CSV. So I know this has no use case, but it was just a fun little hack that I did. <laughs> Uh, one, uh, actually, let's do Kave, and then if there's any last minute questions. Just to pull up a picture. Yeah, sure. I just have one picture to show. Uh, the question uh, how many of us are familiar with I don't see it over here uh, I think I need to push it to the right or something yeah okay, okay. so how many of us are familiar with these tables on the right the metadata table the patient dimension visit dimension uh, observation fact table access can you just raise your hand? How many of us are familiar with it? 
a little bit higher. Just fam I'm not saying expert, familiar. <laughs> okay, perfect, thanks. What if I told you that all the schema on the right, all the tables on the right, it's possible to generate them using this, these two tables on the left? You would agree, wouldn't you? No, we, we, when we do ETL, so what is ETL? When we do ETL into I2B2, we basically populate these tables, right? And we go to the process of creating a patient mapping, the encounter mapping, and then we have an ontology, and then we load the ontology, and then hopefully we check the facts that they actually match the ontology, and then we load them. Right. So while we've been working you know, in, in the group for a while about ETL process, this is something we realized that actually you could generate, if you just have concept. So what we call ontology is something very complicated and has a lot of columns in it. What we call facts and has got a lot of columns in it. Basically, it's just three things. If you know the code, the path, and the type. And if you know, if you know that, it's possible to generate the whole of the I2B2 metadata, except the modifiers. I'm talking some, so we're throwing away 20% of the stuff which we don't commonly use, keeping the 80%, it's really possible to make it very simple. I'm going to just highlight those tables on the le left up here. I've lost my my mouse. Okay, got it. Thanks. So these are the two tables, right? Uh, the concept is nothing but a path, a code, and a type, right? So uh, a GLU of lab blood blood glucose, right? GLU corresponds that it's it's a lab. It's a blood glucose test done on, uh, it's a lab done on the blood. And, and the fact is nothing but who, when, and what. So in this pipeline, what, what we have done is we expect the user, the, 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 the deployer, the person who's deploying I2B2, to generate just these two files from the EHR record, right? And then run the pipeline, it will, and it's going to populate all those things internally. It's going to, so what will happen first is that it will read the concept file. It's going to generate the SQL for the metadata, for the uh, for the metadata dimension, and it's going to get populated. And you know that it's possible to generate the concept di dimension from the metadata, or the, or, the, or, the, or the other way around. So it's going to look at the types. It's going to generate the XMLs for the drag, you know, uh, when you drag, you get a pop-up, whether it's a numerical or, or not. So it's going to take care of all that. And uh, it's going to look at the, the, the path. The paths have got to be distinct. You know, codes can repeat, right? Codes are not unique. The paths are unique. And it's pretty much like, you know, you have UMLS also. You can easily convert UMLS into an ontology. You can, you can, you can do that. And then the next step is that it's going to read the CS, the, the fact file. It's going to find the unique patients. It's going to check, the tool is going to check with the database, are these patients already there? Uh, and if not, it will generate a patient number for them. And it's going to create a new file replacing the medical record number with the patient numbers. Uh, it's going to check if that concept code exists. If not, it's going to prepare an error log and say, okay, this fact doesn't map to a known concept. It's going to check whether the type of the value is going to match the type of the concept, right? So you have validation happening. So this is a tool uh, which we which we have developed recently. Maybe we've been using in partners for some of our internal projects for almost two years, and we've got several projects. Uh, we've got a couple of projects where we are doing this in production, and in the last year, uh, when we are doing this, this uh, yesterday you probably might heard about the Global South initiative where we want to encourage people who don't have 
the time to understand what's in I2B2, what's, what are all the tables, but still be able to use I2B2. Right? Making it easy for people to load data, to deploy and load data. Uh, so we made this available uh, to around seven hospitals in India. Uh, one in Nepal uh, and seven in India. And over a period of, I would say, it took them six months to load. But the six out of the six months, five months were spent in getting the data from the vendor. Okay. Once they had the data, they could very easily, you know, these are people who don't have expertise in data science. Uh, you know, they don't have masters. They are probably bachelors. And they were able to generate, they were able to generate the SQLs on their databases and just produce these two files. Now they don't know, they don't know anything about standards, right? But they are able to, they are able to produce the first file. What is a path? And they have their own local codes. Never heard of a standard code. And uh, so they were able to do that and they were able to load a sizable you know, patient uh, population. So which says that, yeah, that it's possible for, for people, for, for, the, for the community to install I2B2 and load I2B2. I think that was the lesson learned. Uh, just wanted us to be aware that, you know, if we simplify stuff, there's a lot more that we can do. Because if we keep things complicated, and I mean, we need to simplify because we do something, and uh, uh, and it doesn't help conversation. But when things are simple, it enables conversation. It also enables tooling to rapidly happen. So I want to invite. I know you just had five minutes. So I want to invite you for the hands-on at twelve o'clock, uh, at one o'clock. So at one o'clock, uh, you can come in, and if you have a desktop machine where you can install I2B2, it'll be great or else we can have a machine in Amazon. I can give you the root passwords for those machines. You'll be able to install I2B2 in five minutes. And I would invite you to make your own ontology and make your own fact file. And you'll be able to load it into it. That would be the hands-on exercise. It's, it's like a hackathon. And would want your feedback on what is missing, you know, what needs to be done. Uh, yeah. and. And Mike, anything else we want to do, uh, you know, in, in that in the hands-on? Anything we are missing? So we'll have the ETL tool. We'll have a deployment. We can keep some time reserved, and we can see what's what's open, right? But it'll be a hackathon spirit, uh, where there'll be more of action, and less of talk. Uh, and you know, we'd invite you to uh, invite you to actually, yeah, play with it. You know, and even if you you there's something you want to, it's not just this tool. Anything you want to deploy, and you know, but if you want to have a demo, uh, we'll, we'll do it in that spirit. Dan, you want to add something? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, any thoughts, comments? I want to stop here. And obviously, we'll talk in the hackathon. So, there are a couple of people over here who've used, I think, uh, uh, the, the, the social determinant ontology, uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, you, did, did you use it? How was it? Was, did it work out? Were you able to use it? It, it worked out, right? So, I mean, normally when in, a, when in a hospital, when a hospital says, okay, we want to create a research data infrastructure, we want to make our EHR data accessible to our researchers, not with the intention of being part of some network, right? But just making data accessible to their own researchers. They want to deploy I2B2. Now, they don't have an ontology to begin with. Right, uh, and uh, so they have to kind of manufacture their own ontology. And if they can't manufacture their own own ontology, then they have to look at okay, what's a, what's a standard? And you spend like six months understanding the standard. Uh, so in that way, standards can be a bottleneck for advancement. Uh, so here, people can get going, and then as they learn on the fly, and there is a mechanism which we'll talk about about how to. And, and uh, I think Trinetics has, you know, uh, Matt, we explained very well that you just need a local to standard code mapping. And once you have the data loaded in the local code format, the next phase is to have that mapping file. And you have the mapping file, it, will, it can be portable then. So we'll talk about that too. So we can have that mapping file. Uh, okay. So Diane, anything else? I can stop here. I just yeah. want to make sure that everybody yeah. takes a break. Yeah.
All right, because we're going to start at uh, 1030 and uh, do the um, user interface, take a deeper dive, take a break. This is more informal, too. So if people need, you know, like in the middle of the session, you need to walk out and take a break for a second, do that. Um, we also have a conference room um, on the first floor. Um, Desiree could point you to it. So if like a couple people want to go and have like a side conversation or talk, if they don't want to talk in the back of the room here, that's set up. So take your break. And remember, the working group, do the survey, join a work group. You don't have to formally join a working group if you don't want to. You can go to our website and look at our event page, and we've got links. So if you just want to pop into a working group and, you know, talk, talk about like a particular thing without the commitment of having it on your calendar, you can do that. So take a break. We'll see you in uh, 20 minutes.